Thank you. Okay, guys, thanks for coming to my uh, my talk today. Um, anyone in the room in my talk yesterday on Agile and the transformation Agile? Yeah, a couple of familiar faces. Perfect. Um, in that talk, I had mentioned some of the challenges in Agile are actually centered around the um, challenges also associated with learning and the learning that's required. Um, you know, within the day to day, within uh, your organization, within your team. Uh, this is a little bit of a continuation, although I will admit this talk was written first and the other talk was written second. But they do uh, tie together nicely. Today's discussion is about creating a culture of learning. Um, and my name is Chris Smith, I'm the founder and CEO of Open. Um, that's me right there. You'll notice I'm wearing the exact same shirt. And one day I'll be a uh, personal branding. <laughs> um, Today, what I wanted to go over was uh, first, I want to jump into the idea of what are the challenges that we're facing um, in the Drupal world uh, in the context of learning, the pace of technology change, um, and why this presentation and why uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about this exact problem and uh, the solution that we can do to solve it. Um, from there, I want to define for you what I like to do the culture of learning itself. Um, and then, once that's defined, take one step back or maybe even a step further into understanding how it is that we learn and how people learn as individuals and the challenges that we face and kind of the mountain we climb. That beginning piece I hope to kind of fly through a little bit quickly. Um, it is just kind of pretty much set the stage and provide some context for our learning. Um, and then after that, what I want to share with you is my roadmap uh, that we use in my own agency uh, to establish the culture of learning. Um, which will encourage you know day to day and ongoing challenges in learning and so on. Um, before we dive in, I want to do a quick introduction of myself and then grab just kind of a, a quick poll of who we have in the world as well. Um, so as I mentioned, my name is Chris Smith. I think three, these uh, three logos on the screen probably represent um, my involvement in kind of the, the learning space really well. Um, you know, first and foremost, I'm the founder CEO of an agency in Ottawa called Open. We have about 30 people, and in this agency, in this context, part of my role is ensuring that we have actually developed and maintained a really healthy culture that encourages our employees to constantly push the boundaries and to be constantly learning new things. Um, so I need to think about how do we empower them, how do we support them, and then how do we monitor that we're doing an effective job? We're going to talk about a little bit of that and some of my experience there as well. For about five years, I was a professor at Obama College. I actually taught the Drupal and the Content Management course. I also taught their user experience course. Um, I would do that in my spare time, um, which didn't exist too, too much. But I also got a lot of experience teaching in classroom settings like this. Um, maybe a lot more comfortable in that way. Um, it was really interesting to uh, be that kind of a a setting in that kind of a context, uh, meeting with people that hadn't begun their career yet and were just about to get into the workforce, uh, very relevant to my day job in terms of content management systems, and then what it was uh, required to motivate them to learn, you know, to spend that extra effort required uh, to complete their assignments um, well, and then how is it that we could teach them effectively so that at the end of their exam, everything that they've learned in the cram uh, didn't just completely disappear. So I picked up quite a bit of knowledge um, in the actual post-secondary uh, world. And then I'm also the co-founder of a program called Kids in Code. So this is a new program, it's regional right now, kind of in the Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal space. Uh, Kids in Code is actually targeted at teaching children between the ages of 6 and 17 um, um, computer science skills. So we start uh, very young. Uh, you'd be surprised how much these children uh, can retain um, and how great they can become in programming just by the age of 10. We start with techniques uh, in terms of visual programming, a lot more kind of like Lego blocks uh, that the kids can use to then control characters on the screen and solve problems. We then move into a technology called Scratch, as well as with MIT. And by about 10 years old, I can, with confidence, with some background in Scratch, uh, teach a child how to program Python or Perl or PHP. Um, I think, in my theory with Kids in Code, is that if a child goes through a program, maybe from like 8 through 16 or 17, they will be better programmers than the people that we're producing in the university today. Um, so Kids in Code right now is a regional program. We have several hundred kids that go through every month um, and come back month over month, and we're trying to grow, um, find a sponsorship to bring our program more national. So that's my background, and this is just what I'm doing from a learning uh, standpoint. 
Um, I think the reason that I personally spend so much time in this kind of field is because I truly believe that one of my purposes in life is to help people by empowering them and supporting them to reach their full potential. Um, I think we reflect that in the, the clients that our agency picks up. I think I reflect that in the work that I, I do in the programs I develop. Um, that's enough about me. You're not learning any more about me today. I want to talk about you a little bit. I originally wrote this talk for managers, for people that were actually uh, organizing development teams, um, and Drupal teams in specific. And then I realized this talk um, was also very relevant for freelancers, for developers, uh, for senior executives and our direct managers, people, uh, or developers, or so on. So I have a quick show of hands. How many people here would consider themselves to be a freelancer or a, an independent developer? Okay, we got one. How many people would be developers on a, a team context or a team setting? Perfect. And then managers of development teams? Great. And then senior decision makers, kind of managers of managers? <laughs> yeah, a couple too. Okay, great. So what I'm hoping uh, for each kind of group to take away, if you're an independent or a developer, I'm hoping today to give you some tools um, that you can actually take away to establish your own learning plans, to create your own goals, um, and then, you know, maybe open your eyes to things that didn't exist today so that you can become, um, you know, a better Drupal developer or just a developer, uh, you know, a better developer overall. If you're a manager, what I'm hoping to provide today is not just insight in terms of what developers need to grow, but also some of the tricks that I use at Open um, in terms of empowering, providing the right resources, removing distractions, and so on. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I call our secret recipe to create that culture of learning. Um, and then hopefully, at the very end, everyone can walk away with at least three or four valuable really points. Uh, that's always my goal in any of my talks. So, this is the challenge. This is my challenge slide before we start going into my talks. Uh, has anyone seen this graphic on your right on my left? That's the uh, Drupal 8 release plan. Um, that image has probably been around since the beginning um, of the release of Drupal 8. And what it was meant to do was to explain to you that Drupal 8 is no longer going to be like Drupal 7 or Drupal 6, um, where it took five years to get that to Drupal 8. But instead, it was explaining the iterative uh, release plan in Drupal. And I think what they do really well you know that the yellow line is that you see seven kind of spans for seven years, and then we've had 8.0, 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, and soon to come 8.4. Um, this release plan shows that every six months, Drupal core will change. They're introducing new features, they're deprecating uh, aspects of the API, they're introducing new aspects of the API as well. And then at every um, kind of major release, at every six month milestone, it actually stands for us as developers a significant need to refresh our knowledge to understand what's happening in the Drupal ecosystem. And I don't know, it's interesting because I come to these events sometimes and I talk to people and people are like, oh, you're so ambitious, you're looking at Drupal 8 already, it's so early to the game. I don't know if you guys know, but people have already started working on Drupal 9 <laughs> and we're going to be there in like, what, 12 months or something um, in terms of a first development release according to this release plan. So, um, the evolution of Drupal now is much, much, much quicker uh, than it ever has been before. With Drupal 7, we had the affordable, like, we could afford to take two years to figure out Drupal 7 when it was released, and we still had a three year roadmap of uh, being professionals in that space. With Drupal 8, you're literally um, behind if you haven't started by you know, 18 months now. And um, because we're moving so quickly, if you're not constantly trying to keep up with this pace of evolution, you're only going to fall further and further behind. And before you know it, we're going to be talking about Drupal 9, um, and I'm afraid that a lot of people might actually still just be talking about trying to get into Drupal 8 at that time. So that is the challenge. The challenge that Drupal is evolving faster than most people are learning today. Um, and I don't think that when we came out with this new version of the system, Drupal, that anyone really paid attention or thought about it in this way, that it's going to put more, uh, it's going to require more investment and more time from everyone in the Drupal community to stay ahead of But it's not just Drupal that's changing quickly, right? The web is evolving as well. At the time that I wrote this, I found about 1,500 popular JavaScript libraries um, that are being used in the web um, on a regular basis. Uh, technologies like Angular have already gone four major releases in what, like four years or something like that? We have Angular 4 now. We've got Ember, 
um, these kind of headless uh, technologies, or rather uh, these front-end technologies that we're pairing with Drupal to make headless experiences. And then as Preston just showed, the roadmap is even more ambitious for Drupal as we're now venturing into things like augmented reality um, and these different types of omnichannel experiences. So the, the challenge is really compounded in a lot of ways because it's not just one technology that we have to stay ahead of as uh, developers and as managers and teams of developers, but it's actually several technologies that we're trying to, to push so that we're always delivering the best things that we can for our clients, for our teams, um, and so that we don't become stale or irrelevant in the workplace. So that is a big challenge that I hope to, to give you some tools to address today. Before we jump uh, right into my roadmap, my secret recipe on creating a cultural learning, I wanted to define the cultural learning for you, at least the way that I define it. And you, of course, in your own organization, can come up with your own. But what I believe is that to have a cultural learning means that learning is interwoven or is woven into the fabric of your organization. I know that's not really kind of metaphorical on high level, so let me get it down into three points. The first one is that I believe learning needs to be a high value activity. It needs to be understood from the senior management and the management level that if people are taking time to learn, that might be as valuable as perhaps just doing billable client work, right? Um, or you know, if you're taking the time to mentor a new employee, that is just as important as perhaps attending uh, you know, a leadership meeting or um, a discovery session or so on. So learning itself is becoming extremely high value in your organization. Uh, the second part is the interaction, so the transfer of learning that happens between people and encouraging that on a regular basis. In my talk yesterday, I talked about a, a concept called pair programming. Two developers sitting down and working on the same challenge. Um, I think that one, people talk about the direct benefit, you know, better quality code, faster uh, time to solution. But I'm talking that pair programming is a huge transfer of knowledge. It allows the two people working together to solve problems and make sure that they're both uh, learning. So you might want to pair you know, a specialist in front-end development with someone that's never done Drupal theming before and then have the two of them uh, solve those problems together. So we need to make sure that we've got uh, mechanisms for knowledge exchange within our teams or our organizations. Uh, and the last one here is the actual focus, not just on team development, team training is great, but also on individual skills. And I'm going to be talking about some tools that we use um, to track and monitor and help support the individuals within our teams or the individuals yourselves um, in your own learning too. So I believe with those three points, what you're going to do is you can reach into your organization or team um, around this concept of our culture of learning. Why do we do this? Other than the big challenge that I mentioned up above, what are some of the other advantages, advantages that we see? Well, there's two that I want to raise. One of them is a continuous improvement of your own development, of your team's development, whether that be the quality of the code, the effect of, uh, the, uh, the rate in which they're working, um, or even just the ability to find more creative ways of solving problems. I, I believe that if you can establish a culture of learning, your organization will be uh, progressively or continuously getting better, um, and then you're going to see and realize the benefits of that, whether it be from a business sense, from a technical sense, or a strategic uh, perspective. And the second, uh, especially for those uh, visual agency uh, people in the room, is the retention. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but technology is a highly competitive space. Um, and our developers are getting job offers probably on a daily basis. Just by bringing developers here, I know that they have received two or three job offers um, for they did this conference. But I mean, it's also a great learning experience. So um, retention is extremely important. People want to be challenged in the workplace. We know that now. We know that people uh, you know, don't really want to come into your work and sit at a desk and perform the same mundane tasks over and over and over again. Yesterday I talked to developers in our agency that said, you know, we don't want to be site builders. I'm bored with site building. I can only build so many content types in my life, right? So we need to challenge those employees. We need to put them in situations where they're not comfortable. We need to ensure that they're constantly learning. And there's so much to learn, like I was saying earlier, that we really shouldn't have any struggle to find something to challenge them with. Um, and in challenging them, we're going to bring uh, more happiness, uh, more desire to come to work, and those employees are going to stick around. And we have a really great retention uh, rate at Open, and I think that the learning aspect of it um, is truly part of that, for sure. So, how do we learn? I wanted to dive into this just slightly. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, I'm sure a couple of you have read a few of his books, he's a pretty big publisher. Uh, 
he's written that uh, already. Sorry, sorry. Um, he wrote this one book called Outliers. You guys read that book? No. A couple of people have. Yeah. Outliers is an interesting book. It talks about the outliers in society, those overachievers, kind of the Bill Gates of the world, or the Beatles, for example. And he's really just trying to dive into it. And he has this theory that the Beatles and Bill Gates were created um, in our society, in our context, because they had the opportunity of spending 10,000 hours uh, of dedicated learning in their particular field, uh, which allowed them to accelerate and become experts in their field at a time that no one else was doing that. So Malcolm Gladwell says 10,000 hours to be a professional. So in the case of the Beatles, they were playing in little bars almost like every night, maybe two or three times a night, and they were accumulating their 10,000 hours. And I think in the case of Bill Gates, um, it was his kind of academic institution where he was a kid that had access to a computer really early on. And he would just lock himself up in this room and just work on the computer nonstop. Um, and he accumulated his 10,000 hours when no one else was doing it. So Malcolm Gladwell, um, you know, if you like his books, if you believe his thing, uh, his senior, says it takes about 10,000 hours to become a master of something. I don't think that we need to become all masters. We don't need to all be Drupal masters and Preston as a Drupal master. Um, this is a learning curve. Um, you've probably seen that funny graphic of the Drupal learning curve. It looks just as kind of pessimistic as this. Um, but a learning curve with this book, I struggling all the way up, basically shows us that there are three stages in any, uh, anything that we're trying to learn. There's the extremely slow beginning, and then there's this exponential growth, and then learning kind of curves off at the top when you're trying to start uh, becoming a master, right? And let me walk you through why this curve even exists. At the plateau, it's the easiest to explain because we've gone through this uh, piece of exponential growth and now for us to become any better in it, we're really focusing on the nuances, right? This is the difference between playing like competitive basketball and the NBA. Uh, you know, you might be very good at free throw to the point that you can play competitive, but you may never be as good as your Michael Jordan. Um, so the difference is, is very minor. It's in uh, the nuances of the technique. It's in the nuances of understanding Drupal uh, in the, the most micro of details. That's the full plateau, and it takes a long time to become, to take that small gain um, in skill and knowledge. The slow beginning is explained because we don't have the ability to self-evaluate our learning at the start. We don't know if we're right or wrong. So you start giving something a go. When I started with Drupal, I thought that when you made the wrong choice in Drupal, you had to restart the whole system. I did that like four times. Like uh, on one project, I still remember because I would go in the wrong direction. I would install the wrong module. I really, truly really didn't know anything about Drupal um, at the time. And then something would go terribly wrong, and I couldn't get the screen to refresh. I didn't know about Drush. I didn't know how to disable modules in the back end or anything like that. So I would have to blow the entire system away, right? and I would have to start from scratch because I would keep getting a white screen to death. So the slow beginning is because we can't self-evaluate. We don't know if we're the right thing or the wrong thing. But once we figure that out, once we can actually start learning and know that we're heading in the wrong direction and start working and learning a lot more independently, then we go through that steep progress, that exponential growth. Um, and that's where learning is really going to happen and where you're going to be able to make the biggest gains, get the most ROI of your time and your investment. So what I would suggest to everyone in this room, unless you truly are with goal of becoming the next Preston, the next master of Drupal, is not to become or not to aspire for the plateau, but it's not. if you're new to Drupal, getting over the slow beginning, um, and if you're not new or you're trying to encourage someone uh, that's new to Drupal to learn from Drupal, is to support them in getting through the slow beginning and giving them the right tools that they need and getting them to the point where they can self evaluate their progress and self learn how to hit that exponential, and then you'll probably start to get between your exponential growth and your plateau. Uh, the number of hours of dedicated learning, like actual undistracted learning time, we think it takes to get to that exponential curve is about 40. Uh, so that's through our own uh, kind of internal from our own people. And that really is not just for developers, for, for our sales people as well, uh, who are also required to start in Drupal uh, pretty in depth. So 40 hours, I believe, gets you over the slow progress hump uh, of this learning curve and into uh, exponential growth. Great. So now I want to jump into our roadmap, our, our secret recipe to actually establishing this culture. So there's a few different points. I think I'm going to go over seven or eight points here. Feel free to, to jot them down and throw questions my way if uh, you don't understand completely how those kind of all plays there. But the very first one, um, it's actually a really good segue from the keynote because at the very end of the time we were talking about vision, 
And I would say that, you know, a top-down vision of learning and of the culture of learning is first and foremost, if you want to actually establish this culture, it's a way of ensuring that the executive and management buy-in is there um, in terms of uh, learning-related activities, in terms of being able to spend a little extra time on a task to teach or to mentor other people. Our vision statement at OPEN says that we're going to constantly uh, focus on learning to continuously improve you know, our effectiveness and the quality of the work we do so that we increase the industry standard as a whole. So we know that as an agency that's competitive, if we get better, our competitors not get better, better. And we're gonna each push each other higher and higher and higher so that Drupal as uh, an industry becomes just healthier overall. That's our vision statement, but it's all around learning. It's all around continuous improvement uh, internally. And then when we're hiring, we always talk about our three pillars, TLC. <laughs> uh, we love our three pillars because they stand for trust, learning, and communication. And when any of those three pillars are missing, unfortunately, that's the time when we end up splitting our ways with uh, our employees. But I really want to focus on the learning aspect of this. It's being able to demonstrate an ability to learn. Um, it's key and paramount to working at Open. You don't need to know anything about Drupal. You don't even need to be a web developer until previously. However, if you can demonstrate the ability to become one or to learn based on uh, all the resources and material we provide you with, then you'll do a successful or you will be successful within our context. So TLC. So uh, back to the vision statement. And I've been spending a lot of time internally within our own company, kind of developing the vision. Um, you know, as we've grown, I have like, more managers and people looking at me to say, Chris, what's going on out there? What's in your head? Um, and I think that the vision is kind of like a runner on the boat. If you're in the ocean, what's my quote here? It says, without a vision of business, life is like a ship without a rudder, and it's in danger of just drifting uh, aimlessly kind of into the sea. So without your vision, you have no true north. You don't necessarily know where you're headed. So establishing a vision around the culture of learning will help make decisions every day to say, is this a decision that's um, related to learning? Is there an opportunity to be here for us to teach uh, rather than maybe uh, a punishment or anything like that? So that's what I want to refer to in terms of top down staff, setting that management and executive vision. The second um, point that I want to mention is uh, the idea of smart goals. I'm sure you guys have seen this, it's called what, a mnemonic or something, when you take the first letter of everything? I think it's mnemonic. Um, smart goals, so whether it's uh, you know, specific goals, measurable goals, attainable, uh, relevant, and time-bound, they're saying, or the idea I'm promoting or suggesting is that when you're venturing into the world of learning, whether you're uh, mentoring someone or if you're a developer trying to learn on your own, is to set these goals and use this as your criteria for uh, doing so. And this isn't my idea, this is very common. You read this in any sort of self-help book um, or kind of a job progression book or anything like that. But SMART goals will make sure that you're actually setting goals that you're able to achieve quickly. Um, it's something that you can hold yourself accountable to um, and then it can actually uh, positively re reinforce you when you're uh, making progress and setting the next set of goals over and over and over again. A couple of tricks with these goals. So it's one thing to set out your own goals. But one of my favorite things is to say share that goal with someone you know when you promote something on Facebook, you're like, I'm going to lose 20 pounds, and you throw that on Facebook, and you're committed to it, right? You have a social pressure. Um, a mentor, and we're going to talk about mentors later, if you share your goals with a mentor, now you're socially responsible and you're accountable for actually achieving these goals. But SMART is an excellent framework for setting your goals, and then once you do so, um, sharing them with other people is a great way to be uh, accountable for them. The next is your learning plan. So, a learning plan for, for us uh, at Open is actually a long list of everything that we want to learn um, to create or to reach our goals. It's almost like a work back schedule. The screenshot up here is just Basecamp, uh, well, Basecamp 2, I guess. Um, what we do is we look at our goals, and then the next step is always to create your work back uh, schedule. What do I need to actually do to, to achieve those goals? And for us, that often looks like uh, being uh, taking a large goal, and then breaking it down into the small, uh, smallest possible pieces. I want to learn PHP. Well, where do I need to start with PHP? Well, probably the fundamentals of PHP in terms of the functions that exist and the syntax, and then I'll progress my way down until I understand like, the object-oriented concepts. And then maybe there, my next goal is, now that I understand PHP, I want to understand Symfony. So now I need to understand my services, my controllers, my routes, and so on and so on. So you take these big goals and you break them down and you become hyper-precise 
and you map them out, and I really like Basecamp for this because you can simply check things off. You say, okay, I feel comfortable with you know, PHP fundamentals. You check it off and you move to the next item. And then these training plans should be ordered, of course, right? They should be a sequence of events that you should follow uh, to help you achieve your goals. So deconstruct the skill um, and use the learning plan and over and over and over again. And hopefully by this point, you'll be uh, at a point where you can self-correct or self-learn kind of in that exponential growth. So at the beginning, um, you, know, you know, someone should be there to help you and mentor you to get over the slow period. And once uh, you're over that, learning plans become extremely valuable for the, the self-learning portion of picking up Drupal. So building a learning plan is not just a, a sit down and do one exercise, especially if you're managing a team of people. What you're going to find is that in the context of your workplace and the type of work that you're doing with Drupal, whether you're building websites, building mobile apps, and so on, uh, maybe you do a lot more kind of headless work rather than doing just basic uh, sites, your learning plan will need to be iteratively uh, enhanced and progressed. So I mean, what we always say is uh, develop the initial learning plan, you know, test it out with a handful of people that are onboarding through Team, gather feedback, make changes, um, and then roll that feedback into it and iteratively improve your learning plan over and over and over again. The other thing too is because technology is changing, your learning plan is probably going to become stale or need to be updated all the time. So again, this is not just a, a one-time exercise that you do. Um, you know, it's something that you want to work on progressively. Um, before I move on, I wanted to mention on the website, uh, open.ca, a blog I've posted an article about this talk. And it actually has an attachment of our learning plan. So if you guys are curious to know what our learning plan at Open looks like, and maybe make it your own, you can just go to over.ca. Um, and in the blog, you'll really quickly find a uh, culture of learning article, where you can download uh, essentially that plan right there. That's the URL. Yeah. So it should guide you through the first three months of learning um, if you don't have a learning plan today. And then, of course, if this is our learning plan, it's not necessarily yours. But I would recommend that you go ahead and grab it, and maybe it can act as a, a really good kind of foundation to get you going. It includes uh, it's not just Drupal, uh, like site building, uh, module development, and theming, but it also includes PHP uh, learning. It also includes version control with Git, give, and so on. Perfect. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is roadblocks. So a roadblock uh, is something preventing us from actually learning or preventing us uh, from spending any dedicated time learning. So really there are two big roadblocks that we realize on a frequent basis that you need to, to remove. One of them is distractions. So we, in an ideal world, especially us managers, we really wish our employees would go home and spend like five hours learning Drupal and then come to work the next day and just get better, better, and better. But at the end of the day, the reality is everyone has you know, obligations. We have families, we've got activities, we want to have a well-rounded life. Um, we can't expect that everything is going to be kind of in our home offices or in our bedrooms or on our couches, focused, undistracted learning. We have to give dedicated time, and I'm going to talk about what we need to provide in terms of resources, but we need to give dedicated time in the office for learning. And that time needs to be distraction free. So if that guy's server goes offline, your client's uh, offline, it should not be assigned to the person that's in like a learning room or is in undistracted headphone space, but instead, that uh, task needs to get reassigned to someone else that's available. We need to do everything we can to remove distractions, um, whether that's putting people in a, a quiet uh, office space, whether it's implementing a headphones do not distract rule, whatever it might be, distractions are probably the number one cause for why learning uh, does not happen. And I, if you guys have read or seen any of the TED Talks or read anything about distractions, what you'll know is that you know once you get into the zone, which usually takes you between 20 to 40 minutes, a distraction will break that completely, um, and then it will take another 20, 40 minutes to actually get into the zone and be able to start learning that again. So you really lose a lot of progress and time and effectiveness um, if you have a lot of distractions uh, during your learning time. The other is the ego. And a lot of people don't talk about this, um, but in the Drupal community, we have really big egos. <laughs> um, what I find is that, especially uh, when we're interviewing or meeting with people that have been using Drupal since Drupal 4 or since Drupal 5, you know, we're very set in our ways, in the ways that we solve problems. And often learning and learning what the next great thing is, uh, or the, the way that Drupal is evolving, requires us to step out of this mindset of, well, I've been doing this for 10 years, clearly I'm going to uh, do it in my way, this is, uh, it must be what uh, is best. And stepping out of that mindset and saying, well, maybe there's a different way of doing things. 
I mean, uh, in our keynote today, we heard about the evolution of different digital experiences and the way that we're going to deliver content. This is making a lot of people uncomfortable. We need to step into this world that, you know, Drupal is this browser-based technology, and we need to start understanding that our mindset needs to change. We need to drop our egos or leave our egos at the door, and we need to start working so that we can progress the technology, so we can progress our own learning. Um, so leaving the ego at the door um, is really important when it comes to learning new skill sets uh, and so on. And it's something that we'll be challenged with and uh, very clear stuff we have to break down. So in terms of resourcing, there are a few resources that we need uh, for learning. And as an independent individual or as a manager, I think that these resources are important uh, to consider. One of them is money. It's not exactly cheap to learn. Um, internally, we have professional development budgets. Uh, our recommendation is about $2,500 a year. Um, what that gives uh, every individual is the opportunity to buy books, uh, learning uh, videos online, uh, get you access to maybe something like Drupalize Me, which I'll talk to you in a minute. Um, it could send you to DrupalCon or bring you to Drupal camps like this one today. But $2,500 a year for us is what we consider to be a healthy budget um, for professional development. The other is time, so learning time for us. Um, developers, we try to give them about two days of undistracted time um, where they can actually sit down and learn. Um, and we think that that is a healthy amount of time to be able to keep up with the pace of interchanging. So if it's, you know, you're relatively uh, new to Drupal and you can get uh, into it, you know, in two days you might spend more time uh, learning about site building and theme development and so on. Uh, um, however, if you're kind of well versed in Drupal, maybe it's about well, what are the new modules that are coming out, what are the trends that we need to be looking out for, or participating in the community itself. Anything though that is dedicated learning time um, is going to be important and it needs to be accepted. Sorry, there's a bold logo on the screen. Um, mentorship and coaching time is another important factor. Um, if you do not have a mentorship program in place, I would recommend looking at one. Or if you're independent or just kind of a, a self uh, a freelancer, what I would suggest is that finding a, a mentor, someone that you can lean on um, to help uh, guide you through the learning process. So mentor time, uh, especially within the agency world where a lot is based on time, timing and billables and so on, is actually allowing people the time and the freedom to become mentors and not need to worry about utilization rates and things like that. So again, it's an investment financially from a resource perspective as well, but you need to be able to give the freedom for mentors to actually be this role um, and help developers progress. And then finally, here are learning materials. So whatever it is that you can provide, whether it's uh, an internet that has all of your wiki documentation, whether it's uh, video libraries, podcasts, audios, audiobooks, whatever it might be, creating a learning material repository whatever, internally is a great way um, to kind of continuously uh, provide the resources people need uh, to learn and so on. So these four kind of resources, um, you know, are resource categories I uh, encourage you to consider. I want to highlight two different uh, learning portals that we use um, a lot. One of them is Acquia Academy, and we recommend this one quite a bit. Acquia recently launched this about a year, year and a half ago, and we've been helping them develop their learning materials in collaboration with OS Training. Acquia Academy right now is completely free, and from what I understand, it might not always be. So I would encourage you, if you don't have an account right now, to take advantage of the freeness of it. Um, they've got a ton of Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 videos on site building, front end theming, uh, and module development. Another resource we look at, uh, use a lot is Drupalize Me. So this is a small kind of subsidiary of Lullabot there. Um, so this team has produced a lot of great video content. They keep it up to date. And it's not exclusive to Drupal. They actually, although it's very Drupal focused, they also have a lot of great video on PHP, uh, on Git version control, and on Symfony as well. Um, Drupalize Me has a lot more material than Acquia Academy. The only hitch is that I think you have to pay like 10 bucks a month or something like that uh, to become a member. But both of these are really great, both video and ribbon tutorials um, that we use internally um, to help kind of teach. So, uh, some learning material helps you to consider. The other thing that I would um, 
both recommend and caution is the actual Drupal.org documentation. I recommend it because there's a lot of it. Um, there's actually, I think, one of the top contributors lives in Ottawa, Lee Hunter. Um, he's edited, published like some like 10,000 or 50,000 documents. It's just wild. Um, we've got um, you know these kind of uh, great learning tutorials on Drupal.org that actually walk you through site uh, site building and theme development and so on. And because it's on Drupal.org, it's community-based documentation. So a lot of the little nuances that people get hung up on are actually really well documented. So I find it's a great written resource for learning. My caution aspect of this is that because Drupal is moving so quickly, it's moving faster than the documentation is being updated. And it is not uncommon to go on Drupal.org and learn something that is not deprecated, uh, no longer exists in the latest version of Drupal, uh, or is no longer a best practice for solving a problem. So, you know, err on the side of caution, look at published timestamps or updated timestamps to see what new in content um, you know, see if content is still relevant, and then uh, don't be surprised though when you bump into an instruction that, uh, that just kind of sets you in the wrong direction. Um, so, uh, you know, like I said, err on the side of caution. And then the one website that I would ask that you just completely avoid altogether is called Stack Exchange. Yeah, some nods maybe. People, uh, if you've ever Googled, so, you know, how do I do this in Drupal? The first result is never Drupal.org, it is always Stack Exchange. And it is always out of date. And usually, I'm, I'd say nine times out of ten, the answers that Stack Exchange actually provides is never the right answer. It's an answer that works. It's some sort of hack or a workaround. But Stack Exchange very, very rarely actually provides you with uh, the right instructions. Um, and then what you end up doing is building a habit of bad practices. And even worse, you might teach someone those bad practices. And then, yeah. So be very, very critical of the resources that you're learning from and try to stick to the established uh, ones. Um, so I want to talk about uh, mentors. So we're going to talk mentorship and coaching and kind of compare the two. A mentor is fundamentally the difference between a mentor and a coach is that a mentor is someone that you can look up to and may actually um, have kind of a personal um, kind of buy-in to your success. So these people might be friends, they might be coworkers, they might be the person that hired you into the agency. But having a mentor, someone that can actually share their experience with you and can kind of help you overcome some of those big roadblocks, and someone that can help you get through that really, really difficult uh, early stage of the learning cycle is uh, a must. I read a publication that said that if you have a mentor, your chance of success is something significant, like 15 or 20 percent higher than if you didn't have a mentor. So your uh, ability to learn. Um, everyone has a mentor uh, at the end of the day, I think, uh, and if you don't, it's something that I strongly consider you to, to look into. Um, and like I said, it could just be uh, an old professor, it could be um, a co-worker and so on. But someone that uh, has a shared interest in your success is very important. The second is a coach. So coaches are important in their own uh, way. So I mentioned in our Transformation Agile talk yesterday that coaches uh, we brought them in because they've got extreme expertise um, within a very uh, specific area, and they, they can provide a ton of information all at once. Um, what I find in coaches is that they can help in big transformations, they can help in like, big movements and progress. However, coaches are typically short term. The other thing, too, is that they're extremely expensive. These are what I would consider to be consultants or super consultants. So the people they come in that may help uh, with big transformations, big learning, uh, jumps. And then they head out. And they don't necessarily have that shared experience. They certainly have their place in the world, um, and they are important in understanding when you want a coach and when you want uh, a mentor, or even a combination of both, though, I think is uh, very important. So, not, not the same, don't think of them the same way, but you know, understand that they do both have their, their type of value, right? I want to talk a little bit about certifications. It's one thing to learn and to progress and to always get better at your job, but if you have this underlying fear of maybe, maybe I'm learning the wrong thing, or maybe I'm not necessarily following best practices, well, we're very lucky in Acrea. Most open, or not Acrea, in Drupal, sorry. Uh, uh, most open source communities don't have a certification program, but Acrea has actually taken the lead and developed a great certification program for Drupal 7 and even for Drupal 8 now. Um, and they have a series of tests. They probably have like 10 or 12 exams now that are extremely difficult, uh, but are well worth it because what they do is they give you a lot of contextual uh, questions and uh, not necessarily easy answers, kind of like multiple choice. And it truly 
test your knowledge or your team's knowledge on whether or not they understand the technology. Um, so for us, we align all of our training around the certification program, and it also provides a benchmark for learning and a method of kind of positive reinforcement. People are really excited when they complete, let's say, their general developer exam, and they're even more excited when they get through their front-end uh, theming specialist exam. And then finally, when they get that grandmaster title, people get ecstatic, right? So this certification program is a great tool to say, is this learning effective? Uh, it's a great way for managers to know that their investment is not going to waste. Um, and yeah, I, I would recommend um, in our world, because we're so lucky to have it, that you consider the Aquas certification program as kind of the final um, you know, bar to reach uh, before moving on to your next uh, learning goal. And then this is my kind of last point on, um, and it kind of loops back to earlier about TLC and hiring the right people. So at the beginning we talked about the top down, setting the right vision for the company, uh, making sure that we have executive management buy-in. On this side, I want to talk more about bottom up. I want to talk about hiring the right people, those people that have innate skills that you know are going to be dedicated to learning and constantly progressing. Some of the skills that we look for in our hiring are curiosity. I'm not saying, I, we, we don't really look for, for like, do you know Drupal? We don't really look for um, you know, expertise in web development. We look for curiosity. We look for pursuit for understanding, uh, the ability to learn from failure, um, asking questions, and uh, discipline. Those are the types of things that we interview for. And if you're checking off those personality traits, um, in an individual during an interview, or if you're looking at yourself and saying, hey, dude, this is kind of reflecting me or me very well, you might be in a great position to then kind of conquer the world in terms of learning. Um, so in hiring, um, these are some of the characteristics um, that uh, we look for to make sure that we're building the right organization and a culture of learning from the bottom up. And then I'm going to leave you with this quote here. This quote really, you know, I think it represents me and it represents this culture of learning really well. And the idea behind it is simple. It's that life is about learning all the time. It's not about you know going to school, you know getting our degrees, and then just from that day forward never actually opening a book or uh, reading the paper or challenging ourselves ever again. And you know those people do exist today. Um, but I actually believe that life should be the constant pursuit of learning. Um, that you should be always challenging yourself. You should always be looking to, to reach your full potential. And I'm hoping today, you know, that this talk has helped kind of provide you with a framework so that not only you can take away some of the points and you know can continue your own learning, um, but also if you're in a management setting, that you can use this framework to encourage the people you manage um, to continue their learning as well and to always be challenged. So, I mean, that wraps up uh, my talk. I do want to do things really quickly before. Um, before I take questions. One of them is we do have a booth upstairs. Uh, Adam and Shannon are there on the open software. Um, we give away free training every month. It's actually a seven and a half hour session. It's extremely valuable. Um, if you're looking to become a better themer, module developer, project manager, every month has a different theme. Um, we do that session just because we want everyone else to be as successful as we've been. Um, so go visit them and put your name on the free training list and then you'll get invited to that. And there private invites as well. Um, and we make them exclusive to people that come to our talks and things like this. And the other big announcement is that in Baltimore, if you were there, uh, we announced the development release of a new module called Content Synchronization. If you've ever had a hard time trying to move data from one site to another, or content from one site to another, um, this is what this module is meant to do. Um, it's uh, completely based on the new configuration management that's in Drupal 8. For Drupal Camp Montreal, we aligned our uh, recommended release. Um, we put it out on Drupal.org yesterday. Today is the official announcement. All of the open talks will be uh, kind of mentioning this uh, briefly. But between yesterday and today, we've already had over 100 additional downloads. Um, so this is a really cool module. I recommend you try it. Uh, we've built in some feedback features as well into the module, so you can give us your ideas. Um, we're now going to go into an iterative development mode where we're going to do the next uh, our next features based on your recommendations. So it's just project um, forward slash content underscore sync. Uh, I strongly recommend, or I really appreciate it rather, if you could check this out, um, let us know your thoughts and tell us if the check work for you. Um, and again, it's about synchronizing content between different environments. So I think you'll like it. 
So to wrap up, thank you. Uh, happy to take any questions uh, about myself, about the agency, about our the, the programs, and my my work at college or with our kids and code. Um, yeah. Have you already had someone in your team who was not too long, and uh, someone else who were just shut down, so who stuck long? Both situations. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just going to repeat the question. We'll get it on the recording too. So the question was, have you ever had someone just shut down when uh, in the face of a challenge and just kind of kind of give up, kind of apathy, just like yeah, this, yeah, this situation, the situation of someone who just is not willing to know, but it's already in the house. Yeah, and I would say, um, yeah, we've seen that. I can actually think of one particular situation we're going through right now. We have, you know, one developer that's very specialized in front-end development, and we're trying to encourage him to become more cross-functional. And, um, you know, he is pushing back very hard. He does not want to learn. Here. Um, and when we assign work to him, that's, you know, module development or JavaScript or whatnot, um, he kind of does exactly what you're talking about. It's just like, no, it's not for me. Um, you know, for us, the way that we've approached it, and I'm not saying it's necessarily the right way, is one, you know, communication from myself the managers explain the importance to become more well-rounded for the individual, not just for the job today, but even uh, the future career, that in being more well-rounded, you're just going to be better off uh, in the future. So understanding the value of why it is that we're encouraging it, um, helping him in terms of uh, providing the right resources as well. So, uh, you know, it's very hard to come out of your comfort zone and try to learn something new. So more support, more mentorship, more time, removing some of the constraints like uh, having to get billable rates, uh, targets and stuff like that um, has been important as well. So it's almost like to make it as comfortable as possible um, and as well support as possible. Um, if in this case we're making progress, so I'm very happy with that. We've had some people that have just said, sorry, this is not happening. Um, for us, we actually have a rule that if you can't pass the exam by a certain period of time, um, you can't stay at open. And we've had that happen in the past as well. Um, and we've had to let those people go. Because I think in those cases, like if someone's not willing to learn, and you're trying to establish a culture of learning within your team, um, if you make the exception, you're going to set a bad example, you might not ruin the culture. Um, and plus, it's probably not the healthiest thing for that employee either, right? To, to not be challenged in your day to day. So, I, they might be better off kind of doing their own thing. Yeah. Yes, do you have any tips to extend this uh, learning culture to the client who will have soon the new website, for example, and maybe, and maybe close to learn? Yeah, I love that question. How do you extend uh, the culture to your clients as well? Client uh, kind of knowledge transfer is extremely important. And it's not even important from a Drupal standpoint either, but uh, you know, from a project management standpoint too, and in terms of your process and how you work, um, every client that we work with is so different in the way that they manage and who they are. Um, and then, you know, to be successful in our environment, there's a little bit of give and take, but to do that, there needs to be an understanding of how they work and how we work. So uh, we, I mean, we do a few things. One of them is we always try to do kind of a discovery or pre-discovery conversation. This is who we are and this is how we operate and this is what we know. Um, and then we try to bring everyone, like all the stakeholders around that conversation to fully understand why it is that we do things a certain way. And then in that conversation, also understanding what's important to them so that the knowledge has to happen to both ways. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that training sessions, and if you follow the Scrum, Sprint reviews are also great ways of doing progressive knowledge transfer on the technology itself. Um, so in a Sprint review, we say, here's the demo, but if you take an extra half hour to actually teach a little bit of how it was constructed, then their development team or their internal team will have more of a sense in terms of uh, how the technology is built to maintain it down the road. Um, and then finally, doing training sessions. One thing I would like to do is at the very beginning of a full day intro to Drupal. So like, if you're not speaking the same language, um, it becomes very, very difficult to actually articulate the progress that you're making throughout the whole project. So we intro to Drupal, make sure that on both sides, uh, we're speaking the same language. That if our developers want to talk about a view, for example, our clients actually understand what a view is, at least at a high enough level, um, that they, they understand what we're trying to accomplish. Nothing is more frustrating than a client that says, like, we don't understand you, and therefore we can't help make decisions. Right. So if we do this, so we do that, for sure. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, two, we'll start there, and I'll take the last one. Okay. Sure.
Yeah, you go first. <laughs> okay. Are there any parallels between like the way you teach children um, and let's say a client? Like, because children are probably <laughs> more curious and spongy. Yeah. Uh, clients who don't understand Drupal might be more resistant and set in their ways. Okay, so the question is, are there any parallels? You know, in the way that we teach children and kids in code, in the way that we teach clients. Um, I would say that, to be honest, in the way that we approach teaching children, and it, it's, there's not a lot of parallels. Like, because the techniques we, we, we use with your children, especially under 10 years old, are um, really hands on, it's because they have a difficult time grasping some of the concepts. Like, trying to teach a nine year old what a database is, it's very challenging sometimes. So, in that case, we really bring the language down and we explain things like, you know, a database is like a brain. It stores memory and things. So I find that when teaching children, we spend a lot more time um, kind of bringing things down to their own level. Clients, I don't feel like we have to do that. Like, the clients that we work with, and I think most clients to tell you the truth, are sound enough to understand these different types of concepts. They've usually been in the web world enough. Um, however, you know, to your point, maybe there are some parallels if you truly have that client that's non-technical at all, um, you know, they've never done a web project before, they don't understand the concept of a database, then my technique would probably be, yeah, to lean on some of my experience teaching children in terms of, well, the database is like the brain is where we store the information, and the controller is like the, the process when we're trying to recall the memory, for example. So, um, yeah, absolutely, I could see the parallels, um, and it might actually be a good technique for that truly non-technical sounding client. Sorry, I'll take one more question and before I get down here. So. Have, have you managed the curation of your knowledge repository and how much time you've been doing that to keep it up to date? Yeah, so that's actually a really great question. So how do we manage the curation of the knowledge repository? Um, and then from there, um, you know, how much time and resources and things does it take? So the, the curation of the repository, um, a lot of what we've been doing these days, um, I should start with this. At the beginning, it was very front-loaded around the knowledge that we knew everyone had to have, like the naming, the module the development, the site building, and so on. And a lot of our kind of work at the initial development of the repository was actually based around the certification program that ACQUIA developed. So we said, if that's the bar and we want people to achieve that, our knowledge repository needs to reflect that path and provide the right resources. After they hit the certification benchmark, the question is, well, what do you learn now? And a lot of what we've been doing in the way technology is moving. Um, we have a lot more in our repository now about like Angular and Headless Drupal than we have ever had before. Um, because I think of the four or five active projects we're working on simultaneously right now, I think three of them are Angular Drupal. Right? Um, so we're seeing a huge trend and shift in the market. So we're trying to align our knowledge repository to where the market and where the technology is evolving to. I think that requires, you know, in our case, we're lucky we have a handful of people that kind of have a pulse on things. Uh, and able to see, you know, whether it's uh, from the sales or the marketing team feeding information to the technical team uh, from what we're seeing, or, you know, even having clients that push the limits of the technology and force us to learn. Um, and then from there, as we find that we're learning, we encourage people to add to the repository as well. So we don't make it like an internet where no one can, um, only one person can post what's next. Everyone can share what they've learned and so on. Um, and one other aspect of the material we put in there, at the end of every week, we ask our developers to write down one of their challenges and how they solved it. So a bit of a technical uh, blog, it's usually like 200 words. We tell them it's not public, right in our own wording which makes it pretty hilarious to read sometimes. Um, but it's also a great way to build kind of uh, a live, relevant knowledge base because it's literally the work we're doing today um, being shared with all us. Okay, well thank you. Um, I'll be upstairs if you have any other questions, but I really appreciate you coming by for the talk, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. To talk.